Welcome to What the Friday, an After Dark series presented by Mystery, Murder, and Magic. Listening discretion is advised. Good evening and welcome to an all new episode of What the Friday. Did you have a very good Thanksgiving? Well, I ate way too much and my body is still aching from all the cooking, but it was so worth it. I did take a nice nap after lunch and when I woke up I was thinking about the subject of today's episode and I don't really know why. I don't think I dreamed it, but maybe, maybe I did. But it's strange how the mind works sometimes, isn't it? Well, today's episode takes place back in 1968, or at least the first half of it does. And it's in a town that's not terribly far from me, and that town is Gaffney, South Carolina. And what happened there over 40 years ago still strikes fear in the hearts of the people there. Gaffney's located in the upper part of the state, about 54 miles south of Charlotte, or south, I would say southwest of Charlotte, if you take I-85. And it's grown a lot since the 1960s. The big yellow mall, it sprang up by the interstate, and of course there's the big peach water tower standing near the mall. It's a great town with a lot of big city conveniences, but it still has that small town charm. In the late 60s, a string of murders took the town by surprise and struck fear into the hearts of those who lived there. At that time, Bill Gibbons was the managing director of the local newspaper, the Gaffney Ledger. On the morning of February 8, 1968, Gibbons received a call from a man who gave detailed instructions on where two bodies could be found. Even though the caller insisted that he was serious, Gibbons thought it was some sort of prank, but he took the information to local local law enforcement anyway. The police took it very seriously, so they, along with Gibbons, followed the instructions the caller had given and drove out to the People's Creek Bridge. Once they were there, they found the nude body of Nancy Harris. Paris had been missing since the day before, and she was last seen walking her dog and never returned home. It was her husband who had reported her missing. Her body had uh, cigarette burns on her back and a very distinct ligature mark around her neck, leaving it easy to surmise that the cause of her death was strangulation. Her dog's body was later found at a different location. When police left that crime scene, they went to search for the second body, and they looked where that caller had told Bill Gibbons it would be. And it took a little more effort to find this one, but they soon located the body of 14-year-old Nancy Christine Reinhardt, and she was known as Tina to her family and friends. Tina had vanished a week before her body was found. Well, four days later... After that, or four days after that first call had came in, Bill Gibbons received a second phone call, and this time the caller was claiming another murder. It was the murder of Annie Louise Deadman. He said he had killed Deadman the same way he had killed the others, with them begging for their lives. Deadman's murder had taken place a year before in March, and as a matter of fact, they had already arrested and sentenced a man for her death. And that man was her husband. The night before her body was found, the Deadmans had spent the night bar hopping. After an argument, Miss Deadman had took off and left her husband behind. Her husband had said he wasn't all that concerned because she had did that before. But the next morning, he found out that Annie's body had been found in a ditch and naturally he was the first and only suspect. Her body was found in nearby Union County near Jerusalem Road, while the other bodies had been found in Cherokee County. Roger Dedman was found guilty when he went to trial and was sentenced to 18 years. But had they incarcerated the wrong man? The caller told Gibbons that he felt guilty that the wrong person was in jail for the murder he had committed and he also warned Givens that if they didn't catch him soon there would be more deaths 
and it was almost like he was challenging law enforcement. Well, he soon made good on his promise when a 14-year-old girl named Opal Buxton was abducted near her school bus stop on February the 13th. And her older sister Gracie had watched in horror as the entire scene unfolded. But because Gracie had seen it, she was able to give the police a description of the car and of the man. She said the man was between 25 and 30 years of age. He was white and he had a slender build. She thought the car that he was driving was a, it was blue in color. Now, Opal's body wouldn't be found until February the 16th. And like the other victims, she had been raped and strangled. But she had also been stabbed. And it didn't take long for police to name a suspect. Two men saw a man matching the description that Gracie Buxton had given police and he was driving the car she had also described. Not only did they see the man, but they were able to get the license plate number and give it to the cops. Their suspect was 30-year-old Lee Roy Martin. He was a textile worker from their town and he was also a husband and the father of three kids. He was arrested on February 27, 1968, but by all accounts and appearances, Martin seemed to be an unlikely suspect, but he claimed to hear voices. He also told authorities that it wasn't the Leroy Martin they were talking to that had killed those, those women and girls, but it was a darker version of himself that had done it. When he was taken into custody, Martin gave the sheriff directions to where he had left the bodies. Now, you would think that this would be a death penalty trial, and prosecution, they would have sought the death penalty, but there was one thing that kept them from doing that. Martin wasn't given adequate right to counsel. After his arrest, and because he had admitted to being responsible for the murder of Annie Louise Dedman, her husband was released from jail after serving several months of at one place, I, I'm going to just say that I, I found three months and the other said it was 10 months that he had served. But anyway, he was released and they dropped all the charges that they had against him. Well, when Martin's case went to trial, he was convicted of first degree murders of Deadman, Paris, Reinhardt, and Buxton. He was sentenced to life in prison. But on May 31st, 1972, Martin was stabbed to death by fellow inmate Kenneth Marshall Rumsey. Then Rumsey turned around a little while later and killed himself. Now that serial killer case I was familiar with because I had seen an ID channel show about it and I had made, read more about it online because, I mean... Until I had seen that episode on the ID channel, I had not heard of it. And no further than we are from Gaffney, I was really surprised that I hadn't heard of it. You know, it did happen like three years before I was born, but still. Now, once I started doing my research to get more details to do this episode, I came across another serial killer case from Gaffney. And I had heard of that case too, but many of the details I didn't know. So I'm going to share that with you tonight as well. Our second part of this story started on June 27, 2009, when 63-year-old Klein Cash was shot dead in his living room. Cash's wife told investigators that earlier that day they had spoken to a man who was wanting to buy hay from the Cashes. Well, later on, Mrs. Cash left to run some errands, and the man returned to their home and shot and killed Klein. Mrs. Klein found her husband in the living room when she returned. Anyone who knew Cash knew that he gave no second thoughts to inviting a stranger into his house. So why would anyone take advantage of his generosity? Just a few weeks before he was murdered, Cash had decided to shut down the peach farm that had been in his family for several generations. He leased out some of the orchards and he cleared the land for the rest from the rest of them. He also auctioned off all the equipment from the family's packing sheds and the office. 
So maybe the killer knew that he had come into a bit of money and robbery was the main motive. Over the next week, four more area residents would die. 83-year-old Hazel Linder and her 50-year-old daughter, Gina Linder Parker, would be killed in Hazel's home. Both women had been educators in different school districts in South Carolina. Their bound and shot bodies were found four days after the Klein Cash murder. So now it seems that the person committing these crimes are just picking their victims at random. By July the 4th of that year, a fourth and fifth person would fall victim to the killer. The next day after Linda and Parker were killed, a father and daughter would also call Vic, fall victim. On July the 5th, 15-year-old Abby Tyler and her father, Stephen, were gunned down in the family's appliance and furniture store. Stephen would die. He died instantly, but Abby held on for two days in a Spartanburg hospital before succumbing to her injuries. Two days later, a man living in Gaston County, North Carolina, called local authorities about a suspicious vehicle parked in the driveway of an abandoned house car in the driveway matched the description of one they were looking for that was related to the case. When police arrived to the home, they found Patrick Tracy... <clears throat> Sorry about that. Patrick Tracy Burris. He was 41 years old and had a criminal record that went on for 25 pages. And those crimes spanned five states. Most recently, he had been arrested or released on parole in April of 2009, but has seemingly dropped off the face of the earth. Police soon realized that there was a warrant for Burris for violating his parole, but when leaving... Gosh, sorry, the cat distracted me, y'all. <laughs> Stevie's a little handful sometimes okay so let's back it up so most recently he had been paroled um on april the t- of 2009 but it was like he just completely dropped off the face of the earth and police soon realized that there was a warrant for burris for violating patrol or parole but when they tried to arrest him he pulled a gun one officer was shot in the foot officers returned fire leaving burris dead Ballistics test later proved that the gun that he had drawn on the officers had been the same gun used in each of the murders he had committed. And in that vehicle that um, the main call, the original call was made about, they found personal items that belonged to the victims. Now, with his death came a lot of questions, and the main one being why. Why would he... Just pick all these victims at random. I mean, they ranged from like 15 to 83. One was a peach farmer. Two of them were educators. One was a business owner. And the other was the business owner's teenage daughter. Where do you connect the dots in a case like that? The suspect is dead, so we can't ask him any of the questions. Well, that's it for an all new, or for this week's, what, Friday. Be sure to come back in the morning for an all new Weekend Weird Files. Y'all have a good night.